Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. Morning, Passion family. How are you today? Good. Are y'all more awake? <laughs> well, um, pray for me this morning because I'm feeling sleepy. And uh, when the lights get all dark in here, it's like, oh Lord, help us. Okay, but it is such an honor to be here with you today, sleepy and all. Um, I have to take advantage of the opportunity to tell our parents in the room, our Passion Kids parents, um, thank you so much. I speak this on behalf of our entire kids team. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being in your kids' lives. Um, it really is an honor to, to be with them each week and to pour into them. There's so much potential down that hallway if you just like peek in, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. You can join our team if you want. Just come talk to me. But the purposes that God has for their lives are insane. They're not just cute faces. Like they're souls that have an eternity and a destiny here on earth that God has amazing plans for them. So it's an honor to be with them, but I'm glad to be with adults today. It's a real treat. This month here in this room, Pastor Steve has been talking to us about OCD, obsessive comparison disorder. And as he put it, it's like a sickness that we can have and not even know we have it, right? So I didn't realize how much I needed this series until I'm reflecting on the words that he's spoken about like how the Israelites, uh, they didn't actually get to step into the promised land that God had for them because they had sea sickness, S-E-E, -E, play on words there. And Pastor Steve is clever sometimes. <laughs> and um, so, but he really is. So, meaning they couldn't see themselves correctly. So they never got to see God's promise for their lives fulfilled. It's actually really devastating. Then he talked last week about how the 12 disciples were like walking with Jesus every single day. Even they struggled with comparison and jealousy and he talks about how jealousy breeds every kind of evil and chaos, like we need any more chaos, right? But as I was reflecting on his words, I'm realizing how, how much ugliness is still in me. And thankfully, there's good news, because if you've seen some ugly sides of yourself too, our God doesn't just reveal to us our mess. He invites us to bring our mess to him. And, and he's not afraid of it. He says, bring it all, bring all your issues, bring all your jealousy, all your terrible thoughts. I already have heard them anyways. I've already seen them because I'm God. So bring them to me. And he gladly with arms wide open, like I love the song we sang about homecoming. He is the father that runs to the prodigal son. And, and oh, that's, I'm about to go on a different path, so bring me back. But he truly does. His arms are wide open and he receives us. And then his desire is not just to leave us in our mess or to leave us in the condition in which we come, but he wants to restore us, redeem us, wash us clean, make us new. Anybody have that testimony? Are you thankful that he continuously says, bring it all to me and let me do the work in you? Amen. Are you thankful that you don't have to fix yourself? because I sure don't do a good job at that. Something I want us to see this morning as we conclude this series is that obsessive comparison disorder that also comes with bondage to anger, to fear, to insecurity, to jealousy and bitterness. It's not just a sickness that we have to put up with, y'all. It's not something that we're just gonna, I guess I'm just gonna have to deal with it for the rest of my life. No, no. It's actually something that we can be healed from, that we can be set free from because freedom isn't just a good idea. Freedom doesn't just make for good song lyrics. Freedom is actually God's will, so much so that he sent his only son from heaven to earth to become like one of us and pay the price by dying on a cross, raising back to life, defeating death. Now he holds the keys, which means he holds all authority on heaven and earth all authority, 
of death, hell, and the grave, it belongs to him. Therefore, he is able to set us free. And he wants to because he's a kind God and king. Are you thankful? Okay, I keep asking that because I just gotta make sure that you're here with me. Now, um, one of the things Pastor Steve talked about last week that's part of my story is fear. And I just have to say to you that if God can set me free from fear, he can set you free as well. Because fear had a hold on me to a degree that, I mean, if you, if you, if you want to hear it, I'll tell you later. But, I mean, to the point that I was like crazy. Like things that a child doesn't think normally. I was thinking them. And it truly, I believe, was Satan just constantly torturing me and coming at me. But, he, you know, he doesn't just wait till you're old enough to come at you. He starts as soon as you get out of the womb. So there are some things and lies that the enemy's been speaking that I believe God wants to set us free from, and he can do it today. And one, I don't understand all the ways in which God works, but I do know that there's something powerful that happens when God speaks. For this same God that spoke the universe into existence is still the same God today, And he's still speaking today. He's speaking through his people. He's speaking through his spirit. And he's speaking through his word. So let's go there, shall we? We're gonna look at his word together. And hopefully you're believing with me that God wants to speak to you and wants to do a good work in you, setting you free this morning. But if you don't believe it for yourself, I'm believing it for you. So don't worry. We're gonna be looking in Judges chapter 6. The story found in this chapter actually belongs to a guy named Gideon. So for those of our uh, oaky cowboys, if there are any in the room, I did not say giddy up. I said Gideon. Gideon is his name. I know it's cheesy, but I had to. So we're going to read starting in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophir that belonged to Joash the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So hold up. Where was Gideon? In a wine press. What was he doing? Huh. Now, that's an interesting detail that we need to notice. And I'll get there here in a second. But do we have anybody in the room that's ever threshed wheat before? Okay, just got to make sure that I don't make myself look like an idiot here. Because I have never done it either. However, um, I'm thankful for those who thresh wheat. Anybody else like bread? I'm thinking of um, Olive Garden breadsticks right about now. Sorry, I just made your mouth water. But anyways, wheat threshers, I don't believe that they thresh wheat in a wine press. Right? So this detail reveals to us that Gideon was actually in hiding. In fact, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, you find that Gideon and his entire nation, the entire nation of Israel, is underneath great oppression because this group called the Midianites, got a lot of ites in the Bible, come and invade their land and take over it. In fact, everything that belonged to the Israelites, the Midianites either stole it or destroyed it. So this would be like in a, in a modern day context that maybe we could imagine putting ourselves in his shoes. This would be like a group like ISIS coming to Oklahoma City and just taking over it. And we wouldn't have access to Walmart. Therefore, we wouldn't have access to food. Now that sounds silly, but I mean like to the point that you're so afraid for your life that you don't leave. You don't, you're just hiding at all times. And I think that we could probably all agree that Gideon had good reason to be afraid, right? He had good reason to be hiding. But I want to point out that it was in his hiding place that God encountered Gideon. It was in hiding. It was in his state of fear that God speaks to Gideon and calls him out <laughs> and this isn't the only time we see God encountering people in hiding. Let's, let's be reminded of a couple. For instance, when God commissions Moses and says, I'm sending you, go and rescue your people out of slavery, out of Egypt, and you're gonna bring them to the promised land. What does Moses, where is Moses? He's hiding in a desert, 
in a wilderness. In fact, the Bible reveals to us that he's been there for years. Then when God chooses Saul to be the first king of Israel and he calls him out and says, this is the man whom I have chosen, where was he? The Bible tells us he was hiding in the baggage. Well, that'll preach all by itself. Um, but that is, that is what God has been doing and is still doing that he finds us because he sees us and he doesn't wanna just leave us in this state of oppression or fear or hiding because we may not have Midianites chasing us, but we have an enemy whose name is Satan and he's constantly at work. If you ask our kids in the elementary room, they will tell you he comes to steal kill and destroy because he, he's always working to do that. It is his desire that we live in hiding. It is his desire that we live underneath oppression. It is his desire that we live in fear. Yet the same God that called Gideon out back then, I believe is calling some of us out today. And he's saying, stop hiding from me. I already see you. I already know you. And I can't love you any more than I already do. So come out and hide in me for he is like a mother hen as described in Psalm 91 that wants to cover us underneath his wings. Now I'm a little afraid of chickens but because they're kind of fierce like a, a mama chicken, a mama anything, a mama bear, a mama. I may be scrawny but don't come at my daughter. <laughs> For real, like God, he, he is he, right? He's a good father, but he also, because he made man and women in his image, he has motherly traits and you don't come at his children. And he's constantly calling us out and saying, why don't you come hide in me? David says in Psalm 91, in my, or, oh, wrong one. The Lord is my refuge and my fortress. He's my hiding place. He's my God in whom I trust. <sighs> Anybody thankful God sees you this morning? Also at the beginning of this chapter, and then we'll keep reading, I gotta give a little more context. We find that the reason the Israelites are in this situation in the first place is because of their own decisions and their own actions. They chose to rebel against God. They thought they knew better. Therefore, this removed them from underneath his protection. This is relatable to us because anybody ever decided that you thought you knew better than God and then all chaos broke out, right? Anytime we think that we know we should decide where the boundary lines fall, anytime we think that our feelings are more trustworthy than his word, we're actually removing ourselves from underneath the protection of our God and becoming vulnerable, therefore, to the attacks of the enemy in our lives. But the good news is, is just as God heard the Israelites when they cried out and humbled themselves and asked God for help, God is still hearing the cries of his children and his people across the globe from no matter what situation we're in. He hears you. He hears your cry, even if it's a whisper, even if you can't get your mouth to mutter anything, but you have a thought in here where all you can say is, Jesus, I need you. He hears it all and he comes running because that's what we're about to read and that's what we're about to see how God responds anybody thankful that he hears you he sees you and he hears you now let's keep reading if you haven't already go ahead and buckle up verse 12 when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon he said the Lord is with you mighty warrior excuse me my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when, um, when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Verse 14, the Lord returned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Excuse me. My Lord, he says again. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you. You will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none 
alive. Mm. So we see that God's answer to the Israelites' prayer was actually a person. God's answer to the problem, his solution to the problem was a person, and his name was Gideon. That's correct. But we see that God not only hears our cries for help, he hears theirs. He hears them. Who's them? Everyone in the world that's hurting, that's broken, that's hungry for hope, for truth. He's hearing their cries. And y'all, the solution to the problems that we see, the answers to the prayers that are being heard, what if it could be you? What if God is wanting to use you to bring revival to a city, to light up the dark places in the world? What if God's wanting to use you to take the gospel to an unreached tribe? What if God is wanting to use you to bring salvation and hope to your lost family members? You could be the answer. I believe God is wanting us to be the answer to other people's prayers. But we, like Gideon, get in our own way. Y'all, we get in our heads way too much. We, like Gideon, compare ourselves to our family members. We compare ourselves to our coworkers. We compare ourselves to people on social media that we don't even know. Y'all, we compare ourselves to ourselves. But what does that mean? That means that we will compare our past self to our present self and sometimes not even recognize it. Let's see if, I can, if, if anybody else has thought this before. Oh, how I wish that I looked like I did when I was that age. Anybody? Okay. I'm only 30 and I'm already thinking those things. Lord, help me. But we do that. However, let me also help us out. Do you remember the baggage you were carrying at that age? Do you remember the issues you had at that age? Do you remember the, the uh, insecurity you had at that age? Do you remember the the lack of maturity you had at that age. There's good news, y'all. Bad news is, is we're gonna age and we're gonna look different and we're not gonna like it all. The good news is, is that if you age with Jesus, meaning you choose to walk with him from this day forward, then you can know that with age doesn't just come wrinkles, it comes wisdom. With age, we gain more security in him. We gain more healing. We gain more freedom and we gain more intimacy with Christ. And I would rather have with him with me today than go back to yesteryears. It's time that we were, that we were content with today, with this new day where his mercy and grace is is new and it's enough, right? So, your insecurities and your insufficiencies are not an obstacle for God. But if we'll let them, they can be an obstacle for us. Keeping us from saying yes to God and choosing to put our trust in him. So let's, let's learn from Gideon a little bit. What does he say to the angel in verse 15? He says, excuse me, are you sure? How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least of my entire family. Did you, did you know that, God? And, and his response was, it? oh yeah, yeah, I forgot. I'm, I can't use you because you're not very well liked and not really looked up to at all. So I'll just, I'm gonna go find somebody else. Thank you. No, God says, you are a mighty warrior. You know God sees your future self. So he sees exactly what you are capable of. He sees your potential and he calls us out. I believe he's doing that this morning within this body. He's wanting to call us out and he's wanting to remind you that yes, you're weak, but he is strong and he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So you are an overcomer. You are a mighty warrior. Your prayers are heard by God. You are capable of bringing hope and salvation to others. Regardless, you don't need a stage to do it. You don't have to be an eloquent speaker. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have any followers on social media. You just gotta be willing. <laughs> you gotta be willing to choose to trust him rather than trust you, right? 
And God has a knack. I've learned this by looking back at my own life as April was encouraging us to remember God's faithfulness in our past. That God has, a, has the ability, even if you're from the backwoods in the middle of nowhere with no experience and lacking a whole lot of knowledge, it doesn't limit God from choosing you. <laughs> And he has a knack for choosing people who are hiding in caves and calling the weakest and those with really low self-esteem mighty warriors before we ever really see what we're made of. Hallelujah. So let's get back to the story. I want us to notice something else. It's found in verse 13. And it reveals to us that Gideon not only compared himself to others, but he also compared his situation to others to that of his ancestors, because he said, excuse me, if God is with us, how come he isn't moving the way he did for my people back in their day? And I believe that God is wanting to say to some of us in this body that we gotta stop comparing not just ourselves to other people, but our situations to other people. Because just, just because God is doing miracles for them and moving for them does not mean that he's not doing miracles for you and moving for you. Maybe he's just doing it in a different kind of way. And his timing is perfect. Doesn't always line up with ours, with our idea of good timing. And the angel responded to Gideon. Does anybody remember what he said? The Lord is with you. I'll help you out. Everybody say that. The Lord is with you. That means that his presence is not only Gideon's promise, his presence is our promise too. Because if you remember when Jesus was on the earth, he said something pretty similar. Right before he ascended back into heaven, he told those who were with him, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all the commands that I have given to you. And I am with you always. It's not God's desire for us to walk alone. And it's definitely not his desire for us to do anything without him. He promises to be with us. He promises us his presence. And it's not just found in the four walls of a church. We can experience his presence in our cars, in the boardroom, in our homes, because he's not contained to a building, right? When Jesus died, the Bible reveals to us that the curtain that separated the people from the presence of God was literally just split in two. And this isn't a shower curtain, y'all. This is like a really thick, ginormous curtain, almost like a, a, she, a sheetrock wall. And it just on its own split. Now, God didn't have to do that. But what he's doing is he's speaking a message to his people, not just then, but to us because it was written down. And it's basically saying, hey, I'm not confined to a room anymore. And you don't have to perfect yourself to get into my presence anymore. I'm available and I'm in you. I'm also with you. He's accessible at all times for anyone who will call on the name of Jesus. Y'all, God isn't just with those whose kids seem well-behaved. Hallelujah, God is with those whose kids are also crazy. Emoji hands go here. God isn't just with those whose life seems to be going great. He's also with those whose world seems to be falling apart. Because Psalm 34 tells us that the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted. I can point back already to a few times in my life where the presence of God was so, like, I can't explain it. It was just real, and it was, it was near, and it was powerful. And those are actually the times when I was most broken. But he comes. Like the song says, when I thought I lost me, you knew where I left me. And you reintroduced me to your love. You picked up all my pieces and put me back together. You're the defender of my heart. He doesn't just see you. He doesn't just hear you. He comes running and he's with you. So help me preach to your neighbor. Find somebody near you and say, his presence is your promise. His presence is your promise. But y'all, it's not just their promise. It's your promise too. So if you need to say this out loud, say his presence is my promise. 
It is. But there's also another promise. So we're going to read two more verses. Skip down to verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace. Everybody say, Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. I want you to notice something. Before Gideon ever gathered an army, before he went into a single battle, And before God led him to victory, which he did, by the way, spoiler alert, God actually did what he said he was going to do. Surprise. (laughs) No, we shouldn't be surprised because God is a God who doesn't lie. He keeps his words. So before any of this happened, before Gideon saw any of it come to fruition, he received the peace of God. But wait, Jesus says something about this peace too. He's quoted in the book of John. I want to find it in case you want to see it for yourself. John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, but take heart. In this world, you will have trouble, but do not be afraid. This was a promise given by Jesus to his disciples then, and it's also for us his disciples today. If you've said yes to Jesus, you've chosen to follow him, then that means his peace is your promise. Before you do that big thing he put in your heart to do, before you pick up that pen, before you take that position, before you step foot on that airplane, his peace is already yours. It doesn't, it's not something you earn, it's something he freely gives. I remember one of the first, um, I would say, big moments of surrender in my life where I had all these plans to go to a state school and major in the medical field only so I could make money and find security in that. And God asked me to let it go. And I wrestled with that thought for days. And I was anxious. Anxiety is a real thing, but sometimes the anxiousness underneath it lies a deeper battle. And it's a battle between you and God. Not always, but sometimes. And I remember finally, I say battle between you and God. What I mean is his will and you're not wanting it. I remember finally reaching a point where I was like, okay, God, you really are trustworthy. And I don't know what your plans are, but I'd rather have those than mine. So I give them to you. If you don't want me to go to college, I won't go to college. If you want me to go overseas, I don't know how I'm gonna get there, but. You'll make a way, so I just say yes to whatever. And I remember the peace that goes beyond all understanding, a peace that that I can't gain or receive from anybody else or anything else in this world. It like flooded me, took over all my insides, right, to where I was so at ease. And it's the peace of God that he gave before I actually ever did anything for him. And this peace doesn't run out. So as you say yes to Jesus, which isn't just a one-time thing I've learned, that was a first yes of countless more to follow to bring me to this day. And as we say yes to him daily, yes to his will and his way, you know, sometimes we want his will, but we don't want his ways. That's another, for another day. God will also give us his peace Isn't that amazing? Tell your neighbor his peace is your promise. There's something that during worship, I I don't have this on a slide because you're getting a little extra. (laughs) During worship, I felt like God um, wanted me to also say to you guys in this room that there's a third promise. Because as you keep reading, you find that God provided the people that Gideon needed to fight the Midianites and they won. But it wasn't thousands. Y'all, it was 300 That's not many at all. That'd be like first service, second service, add the kids. That's our army. That's weak. Yet it was enough. It was enough to win. It was enough to have peace again in the land. 
And the third thing that I believe God wanted to say to us this morning is that his provision is your promise. And it may not look like much, especially when you compare it to your neighbors and the people that you see on the screens. God doesn't promise that he'll give you all the bells and whistles and the fancy cars and the name brand stuff, but he does promise in Matthew chapter six, you don't have to worry, he says, for I will meet your needs. You will have food and you will have clothing. That's enough. I've discovered and still am discovering that his provision is my promise, but it's also always enough. It may not be extra and it may look like little, but it'll be what you need to walk in victory. Would you, would you rather have freedom or baggage with a lot of stuff? Would you rather have his victory and walk in his peace and his presence or just have a lot of titles to your name? He has so much to give us, but we have a choice to make. I'll close with this thought. When I was praying for today and praying for us, God, I believe, reminded me of a memory from a few years ago where I was spending time with a friend who also happens to be a psychiatrist. And I was telling her how I feel like I'm always forgetting things. Like I make lists for my list. As my husband said, he likes to make fun of me for that because I do. I literally have list after list after list after list. And I keep a planner a physical planner, y'all. I carry it around <laughs> because I need to. I, I just find myself forgetting all the time. And after she asked me a few questions, she said something that has stuck with me and I found it to be true. She said, I don't think you actually have a forgetting problem. I think you have a focus problem. And when God reminded me of that, it just all clicked that that also can apply to us spiritually. Where especially those of us who know the truth, right? Maybe you've already memorized some verses that God has said about you or to you. So maybe you don't have a forgetting problem. Maybe you have a focus problem. And I believe that God is calling us to refocus. We're so busy, but what if God is wanting to establish some boundaries in our lives. People ask all the time, how are you? And a lot of times I hear, and I've been guilty of saying it many times, busy. I don't know if that's God's will. I think he wants us to be able to say, I'm at peace. I'm walking in his presence. I'm not saying that needs to be your response. Now become puppets. No, I'm saying that, that busy Maybe, maybe God wants to reestablish how we do life and, and set up some boundaries and, and you can seek him for what those are, but taking a, a rest day each week is a good place to start because it's in the 10 commandments. Or maybe God wants for us to put down our devices more and spend more time looking at things that are unseen, which is heaven and eternity and he's still giving visions. He's still revealing himself. We're too busy spending hours in front of a screen to look at our maker. Or maybe he's gonna ask you to stop scrolling so much and instead start sitting at his feet. So let me give you three things. If we wanna fulfill his purposes, for our lives every day. And we wanna take hold of the promises that we've heard this morning, the promises that we know he has spoken for his children, then we gotta do. I'll just give you three simple ones. One, when Gideon left the presence of God, God gave him a piece of instruction. He said, go tear down the idols. What's an idol? For them, it was a statue that they worshiped. But an idol for us could be anything or anyone that you are choosing to trust in more than God or that you're giving more attention to than God. So we gotta figure out what those are and put them back in their place, right? 
number two, we gotta stop worshiping just on Sundays and learn how to worship God as we drive to work, as, as we're at home. Maybe we need to be careful what we listen to and, and choose to, to let the Holy Spirit lead us in worship outside of this building. And then the third thing is we gotta take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and not just come expecting to hear the Word of God on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. Read this out loud. Pray this out loud. Sing this out loud. If you don't know where to start, the book of Psalms is really relatable. But also you can read a gospel. I would suggest the gospel of Mark. It's a good place to start, but if we would do that, y'all, we wouldn't have such a hard time focusing on the one that actually matters and the one that has everything we need and more. Would you stand with me, please? So for just the next couple of minutes, I've asked April and Catherine to, to lead us, and thank you, Josh, for joining, to lead us in we're gonna worship just for a couple minutes and I wanna encourage you to let the Holy Spirit lead you. In Ephesians chapter six, it says the battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle's actually against principalities and evil spirits in the spiritual realm. So if, if anybody here wanna wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness, anybody wanna fulfill the purposes that God has for your life this week? Anybody wanna see your lost family members get saved? then y'all, we gotta remember that there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on that we can't see. And the only way that we're gonna win or that we're gonna see victory, not just for ourselves, but for the people in our lives, is if we focus on Him and we choose to tear down the idols, to worship Him every day and to read His word daily. So Holy Spirit, I ask that in this moment, you would begin to speak to us and give us strategies like you gave Gideon. You would show us the people that you want us to pay attention to, that you want us to seek help from. I ask that you would reveal to us any boundaries you want us to establish in our lives so that we can focus on you again, so that we can see you as you truly are. God, I ask that right now you would unravel the web of lies that may have some of us in bondage in this room. God, and that you would enable us to see ourselves as you do, as mighty warriors, as children of God. And Lord, we surrender right now. If you wanna surrender and you wanna, it helps me to do something outwardly. If you wanna surrender, you can just lift a hand or both hands and just say, God, I wanna trust you. Not my feelings anymore. Not that person anymore not that news anchor anymore. I wanna trust you. I wanna walk in your presence. I wanna have your peace. And I want the provision that you see I need. So God, we give you permission to do whatever you want to. And we go ahead and give you all the glory and honor and praise for what you're gonna do. In Jesus' name.
It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.